Rhineland. This chronicle of Germany is a firm favourite of mine, and not just because of its fabulous duration. No. Heimat and I both entered the world 29 years ago in 1984, and it was watching this intimate overview of the century that first set me on my current course of watching a hundred films from a hundred years, making some kind of sense of the 20th century as a single story. Normally, when you watch a film, you sit down, you watch things happen to characters, and you get your resolution, and then the film stops. Heimat, though, just keeps going. It is, in fact, very long, taking around 16 hours to tell the story of a small village in rural Germany about a family who live there. It starts in 1919, and it just keeps on rolling until 1982, by which time our central characters have grown up, grown old, and begotten from their loins a new generation of central characters. In a film of such expanse, I think it's no spoiler to say that almost everybody alive at the start of the story has died by the end. There's something fascinatingly unusual, something Old Testament-like, about a story in which the main characters at the end aren't present at the start at all, and the only characters we meet in the first hour aren't there at the end. Heimat isn't like other films, it's like life. When I first saw it, I made a mistake that's easy in real life, too. I concentrated on the older generation, on Maria Simon, the film's main character, on Paul, and Pauline, and Edward, and I ignored the children, forgetting that they would soon turn into real people, and I'd never have no idea where they came from. By the 50s, the film slowly switched its emphasis and became the story of Maria's children, Anton, Ernst, and Hermann, the last of whom went on to star in Die Schweiter Heimat and Heimat 3, where he became the cinema character I know best and care about the most, probably, but that's another story. Characters who'd been the centre of their own lives and at the heart of the community become parents, become grandparents, they die of age or accident or war, or equally often we leap forward a few years and they're just gone, just dead. Quite disconcertingly, the film raises the strange prospect that our grandparents may once have been children and people, with lives as fun and interesting as our own. Hi Matt is made up of a number of smaller films. See the postscript for quite how that works, and is shot variously in colour, sepia and monochrome, and on a variety of film stocks. It starts almost entirely in black and white, because you know that's just how things were in those days, but is almost entirely in colour after colour television is introduced in West Germany in 1967, August 25th, if you'd like to celebrate anniversaries. It takes a little getting used to, but seems utterly appropriate, given how the century's story is one of technological advancement. Integral to the human stories playing out in the village of Shabach are you know, the introduction of the radio, the motorcycle, aircraft, and especially the development of advanced camera lenses, as a rural community in the middle of nowhere becomes part of the modern industrial world. In the first half, the town's core seems to be Matthias's forge, and I'm delighted to see that the prequel, The Andere Heimat, set in the 1840s and coming to cinemas near you later this year, sees some prominent use of it. By the end, new industries have risen and fallen, and the village is quite radically different but remains utterly recognisable. The final telling in particular is perfectly filmed, timed and edited, and despite its optimistic tone and happy ending of sorts, I'd forgotten just how upsetting I found it. There are lots of images from it that linger in my mind for a long time. Hermann Simon arriving late to a funeral to find a thunderstorm has scattered the mourners, leaving the casket alone in the sopping street, and strangely terrifying flyover of the Hunsruck that follows. This last part uses some strange and unusual techniques, things we don't see anywhere else in Heimat, um, but uses them to tell a story properly, a story that I care about, and I don't think this tale's impact comes from its position at the end of an epic. I think anyone who hadn't seen a single frame of Heimat could watch The Feast of the Living and the Dead, or even just its opening quarter hour, and find something fascinating, tense, engaging, sad and real, which is surely a good set of things for a film to be. By way of a postscript, is this really a movie, as Wikipedia says, or is it a TV miniseries, as IMDb would like to claim? Well, it's kind of both. It's a film made of films. Ein Iconic in Elftalen. It's three called Heimat 3 is slightly clearer on this point. Um, film in Sechstalen. I'm a dilettantish speaker of German, but that's surely one film in six tellings. Or eleven tellings of extremely irregular duration, as is the case here. But wait. How can something be in more than one discrete portion, and yet be a single film? Well, earlier in the Pennsylvania, I talked about 1924's Die Nibelungen, one film in two portions, which at five hours was so long that viewers went to see part one, Siegfried, and then came out of the cinema, went home, uh, Dedepu, whatever, came back to the cinema again the following day to see part two, Kremhild's Rache, 
Then there was 1945's Les Enfants du Paradis, which was made in Paris when the occupying forces didn't permit films longer than 90 minutes. So the three-hour story was told by a double bill of a, a film and its sequel, always meant to be watched together. And then there was Das Boat, 1981, made for cinemas, but also shown in extended forms on telly as a miniseries. Did I spend 11 hours watching those particular films entirely so I could use them as examples when I was talking about Heimat? Maybe, but they were excellent! And so anyway, Heimat was shown in cinemas, and people go along and see some installments of Heimat, and then go back the next week for more films of film. Uh, and rather wonderfully, I understand people started to recognise one another going to the Heimat viewings, and started meeting up with them before and after the screenings, having HIMAT parties. Why don't you have a HIMAT party, dear viewer? Why not? PPS, which is to say another postscript while we're at it, the sequel, Die Schweite HIMAT, is the greatest film I've ever seen, and probably the one I care about the most. And one day I shall tell you all about it. It's much longer than HIMAT, and you should certainly watch it. You won't, though, which I think is rather a pity. Goodbye.